Welcome. Today we're focusing on the uh, really big 2025 American Heart Association guidelines for CPR and emergency cardiovascular care. These are basically the blueprint for high-performance resuscitation. And if you're a healthcare professional, well, you know this update needs your immediate attention. Our goal today is pretty simple. Cut through all the details. I mean, there are 760 specific recommendations here. Covers everything from neonatal up to advanced life support. We're pulling out the absolute must-know changes, the ones that mean you have to update your training, uh, change how you do things. But, you know, here's the thing we have to start with. Out of all those recommendations, 760 of them, only 11 are based on level A evidence. 11 out of 760. Yeah, that's 1.4%. It just shows how tough it is to get that high-quality randomized trial data in emergency care. Most of it is consensus observational studies. That number is sobering. But it really highlights why we need to keep learning based on the best available evidence, whatever that level might be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's start big picture. There's a move towards unification, Q1. What about these new structural frameworks? What's guiding resuscitation now? Right. So they've introduced two unified frameworks, trying to get some global consistency here. First, there's the universal chain of survival. It's now just one single chain. Okay. Which provides, you know, needed continuity. It applies the same way for adults and kids, whether it's in hospital or out of hospital cardiac arrest. Simple. Consistent. I like it. And second, there's a completely new framework called the newborn chain of care. This is really comprehensive. It's a roadmap for providers, starting right from prenatal assessment all the way through postnatal follow-up and, importantly, recovery for the baby. That focus on the whole journey, including recovery, kind of leads nicely into the next big addition, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Ethics. Whole section. First time. Q2. So what's the purpose of this new chapter dedicated just to ethical frameworks? Yeah, this is um, more than just a quick mention. Old guidelines talked about ethical treatment, sure. But this new chapter actually discusses the ethical frameworks themselves, right. you know, the thinking behind those high stakes decisions. It's built around four sort of co-equal moral principles. You might know it as principalism, beneficence, non-maleficence, respect for autonomy and justice. Gives a foundation for those tough calls. Exactly. A solid base for when things are happening fast, unplanned. And within that chapter, there's a pretty strong statement about broader responsibilities, right? About equity. Absolutely. A major focus is health equity. The guidelines are clear. Healthcare professionals, organizations, we should be actively addressing those structural inequities. Social determinants of health. To what end? The goal is, well, nothing less than eliminating the disparities we see in cardiac arrest outcomes and emergency cardiovascular care outcomes. Right. It's a call for system changes, not just bedside manner. Systems change. And also supporting families. Right. They emphasize patient support. Recommending that institutions create policies about family presence during CPR. The evidence is growing here. It suggests that when staff support it, it can really reduce complicated grief, improve psychological outcomes for the families long term. Okay, that's huge. Let's shift gears from the systemic view to uh, specific skills, basic life support, foreign body airway obstruction, or FBAO. Always a critical skill. Q3. How has managing FBAO been standardized now for adults and kids? Yeah, the aim here was consistency. Make it easier to teach, easier to remember under pressure. So for severe FBAO, adults and children, the standard protocol is now alternating cycles. Five back blows, then five abdominal thrusts. Okay, five and five. Five and five. Yeah. But importantly, the cycle must start with the back blows. That sequence is thought to maximize the chance of clearing the airway unifies the first response. Makes sense. Start with back blows. But what about infants? Abdominal thrusts on an infant sound. Risky. And they are. That's the absolutely critical point here. Abdominal thrusts are still not recommended for infants. Explicitly. Okay. Still no abdominal thrusts for babies. Correct. Too much risk of internal organ injury. So for infants, it's repeated cycles of five back blows, but alternating with five chest thrusts. Chest thrusts. And how do you do those? Using the heel of one hand specifically. Heel of one hand for infant chest thrusts in FBAO. Got it. Sticking with infants, there's another big change in basic life support. A very common technique is now out. Q4. What's the specific technique for infant chest compressions that's now gone, eliminated? This is a really major shift. It impacts, well, basically every CPR training program everywhere. The traditional two-finger technique for infant CPR, it's no longer recommended. It's officially out. Wow. Okay. So no more two fingers. Let's replace it. Infant chest compressions should now only be done using either the heel of one hand. Like with the FBAO chest thrusts. Exactly. 
or preferably, if you have a second rescuer, the two thumb encircling hands technique. Simulation studies just show that the two thumb technique is better, gets you adequate compression depth more reliably. The two finger method often just didn't meet the quality standards. Okay, huge takeaway for anyone teaching or doing infant CPR. Let's zoom out again from individual skills to the team and the system. Resuscitation is a team sport. Q5, what updates are there for team coordination and the overall systems of care? Two things really stand out for improving in-hospital readiness. First, on the prevention side, they're recommending safety huddles. Safety huddles, how do those help? They're seen as effective, relatively new way to quickly improve situational awareness for those high-risk patients who are already hospitalized, catch potential problems earlier. Second is about learning after an event, debriefing. It's more formalized now. They say incorporating both immediate debriefing, they call it hot debriefing, and delayed or cold. Clinical debriefing is reasonable. Hot and cold debriefing, why both? They capture different things, right? Yeah. The hot debrief gets that immediate feedback reactions. The cold debrief, maybe a day or two later, lets you look more at systemic issues, patterns. Both are valuable for improvement. Makes sense. And what about outside the hospital? Community preparedness, any system recommendations there? Yes, and it addresses a major public health issue, opioids. The guidelines state that public policy should allow for the possession, use, and importantly, legal immunity for lay rescuers who administer naloxone in good faith. The Naloxone access for lay rescuers, like ADs. Exactly. Recommended right alongside public access to fibrillation. Recognizing that opioid emergencies need that same kind of rapid community response capability. Good point. Okay, let's move to Q6. This one settles a debate that's been going on in advanced life support for a while. Vascular access and cardiac arrest. 40 first or IO first. What did the data finally show that led to recommending intravenous access first in adults? Well, the data really tipped the scales here. It's pretty definitive now. Initial attempts at intravenous or IV access are recommended over trying intraosseous IO access first in adult cardiac arrest. 4V first. That's a change from what was being pushed sometimes. It is. IO access is now considered reasonable only if those first IV attempts don't work or you know, aren't feasible for some reason. And this comes straight from three large randomized trials. They just failed consistently to show that going for IO first led to better patient outcomes than standard IV attempts. Okay, clear guidance based on solid evidence there. Yeah. Let's stick with ALS tech. Defibrillation, Q7. What's the latest on those complex defibrillation techniques like double sequential and any new energy recommendations? Right. So for refractory V-fib ventricular fibrillation that just isn't responding, people have tried things like double sequential external defibrillation, DSED, where you use two defibrillators almost at once. Stacking the shocks. Kind of. And vector change defibrillation, or VC, where you change the pad placement. The bottom line in the guidelines is that the usefulness of DSED and VC has not yet been established. Not established. So not recommended for routine use. Correct. They are not recommended for routine use right now, unless maybe you're in a clinical trial studying them. The evidence just isn't strong enough yet. Okay. Uncertainty there. But there is a clear update for energy levels when cardioverting stable rhythms like AFib. Absolutely. For synchronized cardioversion of atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter in adults, the new recommendation is an initial energy sitting of at least 200 joules. 200 joules minimum for any standard biphasic machine. Yes, for any U.S. approved biphasic waveform defibrillator, recent trials supported starting higher for better first shock success rates. Good practical update. Now, let's look after the resuscitation attempt, assuming we get return of spontaneous circulation. Post-cardiac arrest care is vital for brain recovery. Q8. What are the updated targets for post-arrest care? Temperature, blood pressure, and what about prognostication, especially in kids? Okay, specific targets here. For adult temperature control, if the patient is still unresponsive after ROSC, it's reasonable that temperature control keeping them cooled should be maintained for at least 36 hours. 36 hours minimum. And blood pressure. In adults, you absolutely have to avoid hypotension. Keep that mean arterial pressure, the MAP, at least 65 millimeters of mercury, minimum 65. Okay. And for kids, are there specific hemodynamic targets during CPR itself if you have invasive monitoring? Yes, there are new recommendations here. 
For infants and children with an arterial line in, during CPR, it may be reasonable to target a diastolic blood pressure of 25 millimeters of mercury or greater in infants. 25 diastolic for infants. Yeah, and 30 millimeters of mercury or greater in children one year and older, trying to maximize perfusion to the heart and brain during compressions. And predicting outcomes in kids after arrest. That's always incredibly difficult. It is. And for the first time, the guidelines include recommendations specifically for pediatric neurological prognostication. The big emphasis is on using multiple modalities. Don't rely on just one thing. Use EEG, imaging, clinical exam, maybe evoked potentials over time like EEG up to 72 hours post-arrest. Combine the information. Multimodal prognostication for pediatrics. Got it. Let's shift to education and performance. Q9. Cognitive aids things like checklists or algorithms. Who should be using them during a resuscitation? There's a clear split here. A very important distinction based on the data. Cognitive aids are recommended for healthcare professionals during resuscitation events. Why for HCPs? Published simulation studies show they work, they improve team performance, make sure steps aren't missed, improve adherence to the algorithms. Okay, so good for professionals but not for lay rescuers. Correct. Cognitive aids are explicitly not recommended for lay rescuers. Why not? Seems like it might help. The studies actually found the opposite. Asking lay rescuers to use a checklist or follow an algorithm led to significant delays, really concerning delays in starting CPR. And that delay defeats the whole purpose. Exactly. For lay rescuers, speed and simplicity just get hands on the chest that's paramount. Aids just gotten away. Right. Okay, final practice change update. Special circumstances. Hyperthermia, severe overheating. Q10. What's the preferred way to cool someone down fast in life-threatening hyperthermia, and how fast should we aim for? The guidelines looked at various methods. For life-threatening hyperthermia, adults or children, it's reasonable to choose immersion in ice water. Ice water immersion, like literally in an ice bath. Yes. One to five degrees Celsius water. Over other methods like cooling blankets or misting fans alone, the absolute key is speed. You need to cool them as rapidly as possible. The target rate is a decrease of at least 0 0.15 degrees Celsius per minute. 0 0.15 degrees Celsius per minute. That's fast. It is. And a systematic review confirmed that ice water immersion is the most effective way to hit that critical cooling rate. Wow. Okay. So we've covered a lot. Ten really fundamental changes here. From that new universal chain and their vital ethics chapter emphasizing equity to specific skills like starting FBAO with back blows, ditching the two-finger infant compression, prioritizing IV over IO in adults, the uncertainty around DSED, but the clear bump in cardioversion energy, the 36-hour temperature target. It's a lot to integrate. It absolutely is. And these changes, they really demand that we as healthcare professionals look beyond just our individual skills. We need to reassess our systems. We need to focus on implementing effective team training, really drill down on communication, teamwork competencies, and keep pushing to make sure everyone has equitable access to this life-saving care. Which brings us right back to where we started, doesn't it? That sobering statistic. Given that only, what is it, 1.4% of these 760 recommendations have that top tier level A evidence, what responsibility do we all have as a community of clinicians, educators, researchers to step up and support, maybe even participate in, high quality resuscitation research moving forward? That feels like the thought we should probably leave everyone with as they start putting these new guidelines into practice.